The ocean may look pristine, but there's a nasty killer out there. And it's just one of the reasons why the southern sea otter population isn't recovering well. Now at a forensics lab in Santa Cruz, California, a group of scientists are on the case. My name is Melissa Miller, and I am a senior wildlife veterinarian specialist with the California Department of Fish and Game. So I am a veterinarian by training, but my specialty is as a medical examiner for wildlife. We started finding in 2007 that otters were stranding, especially right here along the coast of Monterey, um, and they were bright yellow. And I couldn't remember ever seeing something like this before. And, and for my job, when you start seeing lots of animals dying of something you haven't seen before, that's when you get nervous. 12 dead sea otters, all with a strange yellow coloration, pointing to one thing, a problem with the animal's livers. And the vets needed to know what could be causing it. Basically forced me to go back to my vet school training days and um, try and come up with things that I was trained can cause very fast liver failure in animals. And some of the things that are on that list include things that otters really normally wouldn't get into, things like poison mushrooms. One of the other ones that was on the list that I dug up even was lightning, and certainly for our area that doesn't make much sense either to have a whole bunch of otters hit by lightning. So that only left me with one thing, but the, the one thing was so strange that at first I didn't believe myself. What Dr. Miller started looking for was a lethal toxin called microcystin, which is produced by a cyanobacteria, better known as blue-green algae. While vets have seen dogs and other land animals dying with similar symptoms, they were doubtful it was the cause, because microcystin had never been documented in marine mammals before. It had always been thought of as mainly a freshwater problem. I was so sure that it couldn't be that, that I tested for everything else um, and ruled those all out and finally called a friend who has expertise in this area and said, do you think I'm crazy for considering this algal toxin, this, this cyanobacterial toxin? And um, he said, actually, I think you should consider it. And so we actually found a laboratory that was able to do some testing to try and confirm this. And much to our surprise, this toxin was, in fact, the cause of death. Exposure to cyanotoxins like microcystin can be deadly for many animals, including humans. Once ingested, the chemical travels to the liver, where it accumulates, disrupts cellular function, and can cause sudden death. The vets had a killer out there, and they needed to track it down quick. Now, five years later, we're still in the process of trying to figure out how big of a problem this is, but we're up to 24 cases in sea otters. It's not just a couple. The next mystery was, where was this toxin coming from? How do you start looking for a needle in that haystack? Melissa's team, working with the Department of Fish and Game's Water Pollution Control Lab and other researchers, got a tip from the Central Coast Water Quality Control Board to check out a lake in Watsonville. We're out here on Pinto Lake. And so we, we ended up here. This is a, a lake in Watsonville, California. It has both a city and a county park on it. and It's heavily used for recreation. Yeah. Dr. Rafael Cadella is a professor in the Ocean Sciences Department at UC Santa Cruz and part of the team now monitoring water conditions at Pinto Lake, as well as other parts of Monterey Bay. They began testing the water at Pinto Lake and lo and behold, found microcystin. Putting two and two together, they also discovered otter stranding patterns mirrored times with heavy freshwater runoff from the lake. We were trying to figure out where all this toxin was coming from and we ended up in this, this very beautiful area that turned out to be basically a toxic cesspit of blue-green algae producing yeah. these, these compounds. Why do you think this lake specifically has such high toxin levels? If you kind of look around, there's an ag field right there. We, we came in through some ag fields, and so there's a lot of agricultural uh, input in here. On top of that, because this is a natural lake, it's actually sitting on what's called a phosphatic rock deposit. And so the underlying rock is loaded with phosphorus, which is a natural fertilizer. Then when you add in nitrogen and potassium and other things that are coming from the farms, you've just got this nice natural incubator for growing these algae. And so what I'm hearing you tell me is we're at a lake that's miles inland, freshwater, and it, these toxins are produced here 
and make it into the ocean ecosystem. Yep. Into things that otters eat. Yep. Otters eat them and are still getting enough toxin to be killed. Yeah, that seems kind of amazing. Yeah, but wow. the, 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 they're growing here. The lake uh, can overflow into this creek called Coralitos Creek. That goes straight into the Pajaro River and the Pajaro ends up in Monterey Bay. And so anything that was growing in here can eventually work its way all the way down into the ocean. And the reason it's a problem is these toxins are so potent that we measure them in parts per billion levels. And so even though you would think, well, it's been diluted at all those steps, once it's in the ocean, it gets picked up by things like clams and mussels and they're concentrating it back down, and then the otter is eating it, and over a long long enough period of time, the otter accumulates this toxin. So when you say parts per billion, you mean one gallon of toxin for every billion gallons of water. That's exactly right. We start to get concerned if it's at about 10 parts per billion in the lake. When we first discovered it was in this lake, it was at 1.6 million parts per billion. And so that's when you're wearing respirators yeah. and gloves and you're not touching the water. How could this have gone unnoticed? Well, until the new testing process was perfected, there wasn't a very easy way to know exactly what was in the water and in what concentrations. The new sampling technology is surprisingly low tech. And we've been putting out these um, passive toxin samplers called SPAT, or Solid Phase Absorption Toxin Tracking, which is a mouthful. And what they do is we put them out for a week at a time and they just passively absorb toxins out of the water. And so it gives us a really good indicator of what sort of on a weekly basis the toxin levels look like out here. The amount of toxin in the environment can change from day to day. Prior to using the SPAT bags, researchers had to frequently collect jars of water from the source. This takes a lot of time and still doesn't tell you what's going on when you're not around to collect samples. The spat bags, on the other hand, can be left for days or weeks, passively soaking up everything that might be in the water over a long period of time. Think of them as artificial clams. So what's in the little bags? And those are little tiny polystyrene beads. Yep, it's perfectly safe to touch. And so polystyrene is just a type of plastic. And so as it's sitting there in the water, it interacts with the compounds in the water and just naturally picks up the toxins and other things. Mm -hmm. and we bring it back to the lab to look for it. In the Earth and Marine Sciences building at UC Santa Cruz, Dr. Cadella and his team are able to analyze the spat bags. Here they can see exactly what was in the water when they were away and zero in on harmful toxins. So we come back, the bag would be in here, we pop it out, we just rip the bag open, literally, and we pour it into one of these columns. We take that column, we put it on this little manifold, and then all we do is we add a known volume of 50% methanol, so an alcohol, mm -hmm. and that pulls the toxin right off. And so that's the methanol that uh, went through the resin, it pulled things off, and now it's in this little vial, and that goes into an instrument over here called a liquid chromatography mass spectrometer. And basically what it's doing is it's measuring uh, the size and weight of the compounds. When it comes out, this is the microcystin peak. So this is the sample that was tested and shown to have microcystin in yep, it. Yep. And so we went through about 18 months of samples looking for any evidence that the toxin came from something in the ocean. Mm -hmm and showed that, no, the only place it could have come from is from the land. It washed down through the watershed. It got into the coastal ocean. It got into animals, including animals, uh, invertebrates that we eat. And then the otters got it. And so we're absolutely convinced that we know it happens. We know it's related to things that are going on in the land. And it's having this really direct impact in the ocean, particularly on the otters. This is what real science is all about. This collaboration brought scientists together to solve a question that will protect both sea otters and humans from a deadly toxin. And the whole project just helps illustrate that the ocean starts at the top of the mountain.